imagine you're gonna build a house. You want a large white house with several floors. You want three balconies, a big pool in the front yard. And your relatives want you to have a huge garden because they want you to build a stable one day in the future. It's important that you listen to your relatives because they are the ones who are gonna finance your house. But you have to build it in three months. You're gonna end up with a cottage. But maybe you should thank your realistic sister to help you make sure that it ended up a complete cottage instead of a tenth of a palace. Dear Paradox fans, my name is Anna Norvik, and I have to be that realistic sister sometimes, <laughs> if not always. I work as a project lead at Paradox, which means that I'm responsible for time and budget. I've been working at Paradox for almost three and a half years now. And on the slide, you can see what games I've been working on. First, I started at the publishing side of Paradox, worked together with Fred a lot. And then I wanted to know more about the games, how the games are actually made. So I moved into Paradox Development Studio, became a coordinator, and then became a project lead. So for Stellaris and Marin Nostrum, I worked as a coordinator, but then I was the full project lead for uh, Rights of Man, Mandate of Heaven, Monks and Mystics, and uh, Reapers 2. Here we can see the CK2 team. And without the teams, I couldn't do you know, the expansions myself. So of course I had to have teams, and here's the CK2 team. Here we have the EU4 team, picture from a stream. With this presentation, I have two goals. And the first one is that I want you to learn about the game development process. The second one is that I want you to see the complexity behind the development process, so that you understand why we can't just fulfill all our fans' dreams every time we release a patch or an expansion, that there is more to it. The agenda today is that we're gonna go through the pre-production phase, the planning, the sprints, the Polish weeks, the release candidate time period, the release time, the hotfix if needed, and a post-release patch. Disclaimer, this is the only sausage image you'll see today. <laughs> Let's start with the pre-production. And the goal of this phase, together with the planning, is to make sure that we know what to do and when in the upcoming phases of the production. And it starts by the designer or game director, who is responsible for the overall design, to create a beautiful design document, which is often quite long. Here we have the actual, at least almost the actual uh, design document for Monks and Mystics. A bit shortened, but still, it's the features. So system for societies, content for societies, all kinds of things. And next, we have a design go through meeting when we have set the general design. We want the teams to know exactly what the intention of each feature in the design document is. And they get to ask questions. And this is really important because everything needs to be clarified in order for us to go to the time estimations in the next phase and task breakdowns. And during this phase, is often a flow of ideas, uh, and, and no one real, no, <laughs> really knows where it's going to end. Because the design in this phase changes a lot. The design document is a very changing document during the whole expansion process, but especially in, during this time. And the next step, when everything should have been clarified in the design document, we have a detailed design document, and it's time to break down each feature into tasks. So 
here we group with each profession. We have coders, content designers who write events, for example, and artists. And together within each profession, they each break down, go through all the, uh, the features. Oh, it's going ahead. Uh, breaking down all the features into smaller tasks. And uh, this, in an ideal world, would of course be easy and everything, everyone thinks the same tasks. But of course, there are complications to this. For example, some tasks can be done either by the consigner or the coder, and then we have to draw a line between them. So also quite hard to remember all the tasks always. For example, that we have to make DLC locks and tooltip iterations and iterations on the actual features. But we do our best. Here we have a task breakdown, an example of the meritocracy feature for EU4, uh, for Mandate of Heaven, which we released quite recently. And these are the tasks for the coders. So we have the graphical user interface uh, that had to be implemented, had to track daily updates, and mod make a modifier, decrease database, effect of decrease, tooltip improvement and iterations, as well as AI. And then we get to the most exciting part for the project lead, at least in my opinion, is the time estimation part. And this is also where a lot of things can go wrong, worst case. And in almost all cases, it's impossible to estimate exactly accurately. Uh, but we, we have a system to ensure that we at least do our best and so that we can measure speeds instead of talking confu confusingly about days. For example, this will take one day, but then in the end, whose day is that? Depending on who it is who's going to implement it, it's going to take different times. So we use t-shirt sizes. We have extra small, small, medium, large, extra large, and all the extras for large. And that is usually quite tricky. Um, before we go to the example, I want you to show how we're doing this. In an ideal world, all of the people in the profession would uh, say the same estimate. But we use uh, planning poker cards, which I brought you here. And this is a way for people not to get biased by each other's guesses on the estimates. <laughs> Here the, the coffee break card. But we also have, uh, uh, well, smalls, uh, extras, larges, and all different estimates, you know. So you turn them upside down at the same time, and then you show what you guess. And as I said, it's, it's quite difficult, and most of the time it's not the same that people are guessing. So what we have to do then is having meaningful discussions about what goes really into this task. And we have the team designer in this meeting who can help clarifying what really has to be done. And reasons for why this can differ between different people in the same profession is, for example, that one person has worked on a similar feature like two years ago and has one idea of how it's going to be made. Another person has just started and has no idea, just widely guessing. A third person, well, maybe have talked with the designers and know more exactly what they want. So those three visions might end up in different estimates, but then we try to you know, set down what, what really should be the estimate, a consensus on the estimates. And here we can see the uh, estimates on the meritocracy feature for EU4. And here you can also see what the condescenders estimated. We had fewer tasks for, for script and art, but those still have to be estimated so that we can plan. And in the end, see what, what is the bottleneck in the project. So condescenders had to make 10 events, script decrease, art had to make a new icon and decrease icons, and code had to do what we looked at earlier. 
And in the end, when, when we have all of those estimates together, we get it in the document that calculates how many points we need to get this expansion done. And that document might tell us that it takes 26 weeks to get it done, because content designers will need 26 weeks. So 26 weeks in calendar time. Sound and music also has to be planned, but it's not as much of a bottleneck usually, because it's, it's less work needed and it can be put in the middle of the expansion. So what do we do? Well, we only have 13 weeks because we have to release some time. And this is where the project lead has an important role. Destroyer of designer dreams. <laughs> Drinker of designer tears. We have to cut half of the design to make this happen. Unfortunately, so, so the designers get a lot of work here to decide what's most prioritized to actually release this expansion. And it's, it's often quite difficult. And consider that all the different features have different estimates as well. So it's not only a number of features that have to be cut, but we also have to consider how much of each profession is needed for the features. But then we will end up with something taking 13 weeks instead. And maybe the professions have reassigned, have gotten um, more aligned in how much time they need to take. And I say, OK, let's go with this. We can do that. The next step is to get all of those tasks into JIRA. And JIRA is the uh, database which we use to track all tasks and bugs that we have for our projects. How many here have heard of JIRA before? Most of you. I think a lot of you know already a lot about development. But I hope you can learn something new here as well about how we do it. So we import all the issues from a document into JIRA with all the estimates. And then we have to divide them into sprints. But to know what we should do first, we need some more information. So I usually ask the QA, quality assurance testers, that they should make estimates of how long time things will take to test, and also how risky they are to test. The designers have to prioritize as well, not only when things have to be cut, but also how important they are so that we, at a later stage, if we need to cut, already know that, that we do the most important things first. So that's also one aspect. And together with the estimates, we get a lot of information that we need to prioritize in which order we do this. Naturally, if something is blocking something else that has had to be done before something, then we have to consider that as well here. But that makes up the sprint planning. And then the task can be put into the different sprints in JIRA that we have set up. And we also have to decide who is going to make what. But usually, the people in my teams have a lot of freedom. So they see the sprint that we're working in. And we're going to talk more about sprints soon. But, but it is a time period. And they can choose what they like for the sprint being. But it's, um, we have an approximate priority in the sprints as well. And we have to decide when. Um, but that's what we get from all this information. So the sprint. Sprint is actually a Scrum concept. And, and Scrum, as some of you might know, is a software development method with a lot of tools and processes that you can use, which we will talk about later as well. But for us, one sprint means three weeks of development, or rather two weeks of creating actual features for the expansion, and then one week of fixing the stuff that have come up from the previous two weeks. So that is the kind of buffer that we have. And we usually have three of those sprints in an expansion project before we get to what we call feature freeze. And as I mentioned, Scrum is something that we partly use. 
But in an ideal world, you could use 100% Scrum and you have very regular releases of, of patches and you're just releasing what you have done. But that's not really how game development works, because we have to commit to a certain release date at a certain point in time. And that makes it more complicated. So I would say at max, we can maybe use 80% of Scrum, and currently we're using something like 50% of Scrum, whereas before we were using even, even less of Scrum. And so Scrum is then different ways of working, and what we have is, for example, the daily stand-up meetings where we coordinate everything in the morning with the whole team. We had a sprint review where the game director is supposed to attend and approve the features that we made, that it looks according to intention. And we had the sprint retrospective, uh, which in an ideal world, of course, we would not need to get better, but, but in the real world, we always have things to improve upon. And therefore, we, we gather together, write on post-its what we can do better and what went well, so that we know what we should continue doing and what we can have action points on changing. However, we don't call the roles exactly the same as in the Scrum process. No, it's stuck, I think. Let's see. There. So this is what it looks like, looks like for us instead. We have a game director. For example, Johan in EU4, he is responsible for the creative vision of the game as main responsibility. And project lead, as I said, for time and budget. We also have our tech lead in EU4, it's uh, his Rickard. And he is responsible for the overall stability, uh, mainly, of the expansions. Then we get to the Polish weeks. And they usually consist of three to four weeks, depending on how you define them. So we have at least three weeks of fixing bugs on the expansion and if we have a release patch. And then we have to build our release candidate. So that is the, the build that is supposed to be tested. And if it's approved, then it's going to get released. And we get to the release candidates. This is actually the second image. <laughs> Didn't see this before. And the release candidate, it's um, something that we need then to approve. Um, but it's not often the case that it's approved the first time. So we have to build a lot of release candidates. And hopefully in order to achieve our so-called GM, which is also a known concept in the game industry. The GM is the final build that we're going to release, and that's what we want to achieve with the RC. So the RC turns into a GM if it's approved. And here we get help from our dear department verification, and they go through that everything is working as intended with the features, but not only the features, but also, they have to test all the basic stuff around the game, like starting MP, like is the logo shown at the right place, the right time, and is it possible to just start single player? Things like that. And it's a tough work, but in the end, if we're lucky, after a few submissions of the release candidate, it's finally approved. And that is what we're going to release. And uh, everyone is happy at this time. We're just looking forward to the release then, which is around three weeks after when we build the RC or the GM period. And these this three weeks, they are there so that, so that even if we are delayed now and then, some days, then we can still release it at the date that we have communicated before in the announcements. So it doesn't matter if it's a few days delayed, we can still release it, but however, if it's several weeks, we have to reconsider. And it's time for release. As you know, we're usually releasing on Tuesdays at 3 p.m. And people get nervous 
around this time. <laughs> but it's, um, it's, it's really good when the release has happened and everything went smooth. It's not always the case here either, because uh, lots of things can go wrong at release. It can be both the build that we have, well, from the start, that we have programmed something strange, for example, or that the build system is building incorrectly, or that the, uh, the Steam push, or that when, we, when we get the build to Steam, that that is um, making something wrong. And uh, it takes some time to uh, search for where the error comes from, if anything like that comes up. I know that at one point in time, we actually released a DLC that looked empty. Might have been for Horse Lords. I don't remember exactly. But it was a few minutes where no one could get the DLC. And that's, of course, that's the time when everyone has to be on their toes and be ready to fix the stuff that come up. So we usually stay a few hours on the release day to make sure that nothing like that is in the build and that people can start playing directly. And then we go home, and people play the expansion. Here we have, uh, for EU4, we can see the meritocracy feature and uh, for uh, Mandate of Heaven, then. So what it looks like in the end. And we like reading Steam reviews, especially the good ones. It's easy to get stuck in bad ones as well. Um, but it's, of course, the, the best to read things like this. Uh, this is for Rights of Man, most detailed DLC ever, deserves this price. Good job, Paradox, as usual. Then you're happy. It's... But the day after, QA starts crying. Because <laughs> QA, our testers, um, they discovered that in our bug forums on forum.paradoxplaza, the Americans have woken up and... <laughs> And lots of issues are reported, which they had to go through. And at the same time, we're, we had to plan this hotfix that we might need if, if things are urgent. For example, if a very common crash is known and that we hear about, we had to make that hotfix, and QA has to split their focus between reporting serious bugs from the forum, but also testing the hotfix that we want to release with you know, smoke tests and, and everything we need. Smoke tests were the tests that checks all the basic stuff. So it's a very stressful time for QA here around the release just after. But then um, we always have some time allocated for the post-release patch, which is usually two to three weeks after the release, so that we can address the issues in a more structured way. Things that are not super urgent that they need a hotfix, but still things that we should patch. And then the development team work on this uh, just after the hotfix has been released, up until this time. And sometimes it contains events and new art, and sometimes we have to focus on just the bugs. It depends a bit on how much time we have. But here, what's important to remember, he remember here is that we also had to go through this process again of verifying everything basic and everything we have bug fixed, and if we have added any new content. So, so it's quite a long process to test that as well, and you know, resubmitting new release candidates for this patch, which then takes time. And this is how it looks like then. And after all those steps, we have the three sprints, we have the polish weeks, we have the release candidates, the three weeks buffer time, and the release, the patch, and then the circle is complete. And even though there are so many complexities in developing games, I just can't imagine a more fun and interesting industry to work in. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So we have time for a few questions. Um, Anna is keen about time scheduling, as you've probably heard by now. So we'll try and uh, just a handful, I think. Here we go. Thank you. Um, how do you convert t-shirt sizes to 
actual wigs? That's a really good question. It's also part of, uh, of this um, Agile or Scrum process. It's, it's often uh, mentioned that uh, you convert them into points. So, um, so for example, for us it's usually that a small is worth one point, a medium can be worth three or 3.5 points. So it's, it's, it's not just that it's small is one and the medium is two, because it's all about complexity. So we, uh, it's up to the judgment of the people in the profession to, to judge how much, how much worth of a point it is. But then when those points are converted, we measure people's different speeds in those points. And yeah, so we, we need the numbers, definitely. Yeah. Okay, this way. Um, so you've described mostly the happy trail of how things are going, sort of the um, you're only crushing some of the designers' dreams. You're mostly uh, free of bugs. I'm, I'm really curious about uh, said crushing of dreams. Like, how does you, how do you go about doing that? Uh, do you consult with a designer? Do you go uh, looking for the biggest tasks or uh, the what are the community desires? Like, yeah, um, yeah, it's also a really good question. Uh, we uh, we have a discussion with the uh, game director, so it's usually. I and the game director, we have to get in agreement about what to cut. Uh, so I usually come up with a few suggestions, but the game director has usually also thought about some things that can be cut. So, um, so it was, yeah, it takes some time to think about it, because I also have to consider then when the game director comes up with the suggestions, I have to see like how much time does this take off, and then how oh, we need to to remove even more, and then I get back, and the game director might say, uh, no, I don't know what to cut, and then I might say that this feature is exactly what would be needed to be cut in order to get to the time we need. So, uh, and then the designer might say yes to that. Um, so, but it's, it's, it's really complicated, and uh, therefore it's quite important that the, the game director has thought when he or she writes the design document about what is really the core of this expansion and what's more like nice to have quality of life features. And if there's any disagreement, we have a large collection of swords in the office. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, next question, up the front here. The uh, t-shirt sizes for the size of problems is quite neat, but quite often, um, well, I haven't worked in games, but spheres I have worked in, quite often you come across a situation where this might be extra small, this might be extra small, but this actually relies on this. And you've got a string of things which rely on one another. How do you deal with those? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I mentioned something uh, related to it, that, that we have to consider all the blockers for the different tasks when we put them into the sprints. But we still, we still do estimate it as an extra small if it is you know, that's the time it's going to take. But we have to make sure that it is in the right order from the start, so that it takes an extra small when we get there. Is that an answer to your I'm question? Yeah. You what oh, what we cut? Yeah. Oh, isn't that the previous, what the previous question? Yeah. This one Ah, right, yeah. Just to yeah, say that course. back so everyone else can hear it, he's saying about you can't cut one thing, which, you know, you can cut one, it might impact another. So, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah I, always, I always see it as a, you know, full uh, thing that we have to cut. So if this one has to be cut, if we cut this, then this thing is what I tell the designer that we have to cut in that case, and that's what we do. So yeah, a lot of things can then be cut just by cutting something that seems small at the start, but then it ends up being a lot of things. So, uh, we all play strategy yeah. games, collateral damage is a thing. Yeah. No. Um, next question, and I think the final question now. Um, I'll take this gentleman here. Even with all, those, all that planning, do you still need crunch times every now and then? Oh, we, uh, we actually have said internally that we don't plan for crunching. So, I mean, it, it sounds pretty obvious in one sense, um, but it's, uh, it has happened once in one and a half year that uh, the CK2 team has crunched formally, and it was five days spread during 10 days that they could choose like which days to, to pick. So, so we crunched quite little, I would say, compared to what I've heard from other game companies. 
Uh, and, and it is really uh, something that the management at PDS also tries to make sure that we, that we really keep down any kind of crunching. And if anything needs to be crunched, or if a time period is where we have to crunch, then we have to go through the PDS management to get an approval, even that kind of longer process to get crunched. So right now, I can't just say to my people in the teams that, like, you have to crunch those two weeks. I just have to get this approval first. Great. I think that wraps it up. Um, thank you very much, Anna. I think we should give Anna a round of applause. Right.